thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the concert hall this evening for a slightly unusual presentation by the Winnipeg Symphony Orchestra. This is an opportunity for us as a symphony orchestra to be involved with an act of recreation of a work that hasn't been performed for almost 40 years. It's the violin concerto of Sophie Carmen Eckhart Gramate, the uh, composer who we're proud to call Canadian, who actually died in 1974. This particular work has been performed before in Europe, uh, but it hasn't been presented here in North America, and it's the result of several uh, months of intensive academic work by Dr. Eckhart's personal assistant, Paul Wickard, who's actually put this piece together from various manuscript sources, and the process is going to be described by the WSO's composer-in-residence, Glenn Buer. We are particularly delighted, though, to welcome this evening uh, in our audience the uh, late composer's husband, Dr. Ferdinand Eckhart. Those of you with perhaps a slightly more macabre interest in historical detail might also like to know that there is an added element of excitement and suspense to this evening's performance, because at the attempted European premiere, the conductor collapsed and died during the first half. <laughs> Needless to say, I'll be hoping that that won't be uh, repeating itself this evening, but it does add a certain frisson to the occasion, you know? However, I'm sure you'd like to give a very warm welcome to uh, the WSO's own concertmaster, uh, Gwen Hobig and composer in residence, Glenn Buer, who will act as our host for this evening. Thank you. As, as uh, Maestro Tovi has already suggested, this is going to be kind of an unusual event. The Winnipeg Symphony is used to giving concerts, and tonight will be no exception. Uh, after the intermission, we'll, we will be presenting the two works. The first is Molto Sostenuto, which is a very gentle and beautiful evocative work, and it gives a certain aspect of the composer's personality. And the second, of course, is the North American premiere of the Violin Concerto, which gives several aspects of the composer's personality, and we'll talk about those, and we'll hear some excerpts in a few minutes. The reason the orchestra doesn't look quite like they're ready to play is that we wanted to um, bring the atmosphere of a rehearsal to the concert hall and give you a feeling about what it's like to put together a piece, especially a piece, and you have to realize this is a, a, a work that no one has heard yet. Uh, probably no one in this room has heard it in this particular version. The, the players, the conductor, and the soloist have been putting this together throughout the week, and it's quite an arduous task, and I think you'll find it quite interesting when we get into the open rehearsal portion of the program. But indeed, there's a reason that we've called this program tonight a portrait of Sophie Carmen Eckhart Gramate. Uh, she was incidentally called by her good friends and, and dear ones, Sonia. So if I refer to her as Sonia, it's because whenever I've read any biographical material, it was always written by Dr. Dr. Eckhart himself, who always referred to her, her as Sonia. Um, so there's a reason we call this a portrait, and I think uh, you can best understand a person's character and personality through art. And um, this is a very, very colorful personality that we're talking about, someone that's lived in the, the major artistic centers in the world, including this one, of course, and uh, someone um, who has rubbed shoulders with some of the greats in the music and artistic world. When she was uh, living in Berlin, she met the German expressionistic painter, Walter Gramate, and they were married in 1920. Now, he died nine years later when she was only 30 years old, but in that time he painted well over 100 portraits of her. And there's 27 of these out in the lobby. Most of you have probably seen them already, and at intermission I think you can get a chance to get another peek at those. So that's one aspect of the portrait that we're showing tonight. Uh, and that was by her first husband. But of course, um, uh, we have in our presence, he's already been introduced to you, Dr. Eckhart, and he's been uh, going at the portraiture in his own way as an art critic and a writer, uh, he's already published a biography of Sophie Carmen. It exists in a long version that is yet unpublished, and I'll read a quote or two from that this evening. Uh, but that, the shorter version is available, it's been published, and it's, it makes an excellent read, and it's, uh, I think, that as element of getting to know someone through someone that was very close to them that I think gives you a better idea of what the composer was really like. 
Okay, now I'd, I'm not going to have time tonight to go into a lot of biographical detail. I would encourage you to uh, corner Dr. Eckhart during the um, intermission or after the concert and ask him anything you like about the composer. I'm sure he'd be delighted to, uh, to uh, fill you in on all sorts of details. But as I mentioned, she was work living through uh, European history when art was in revolution. I mentioned the German expressionistic movement uh, that was going uh, through Germany and Austria right from the turn of the century to, through the 20s. And she was a very important part of that. She was, in fact, born in 1899, which is about five years after Debussy completed his Prelude to the Afternoon of a Fawn, which had its influence in revolutionizing music. 1899, the year she was born, was also the year that Arnold Schoenberg wrote uh, the work Verklarte Nacht, which is one of the earliest examples of romantic expressionism in music. Uh, as a young girl, she was living in Paris uh, in 1912 when, when the revolutionary production of Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring was happening. She met Stravinsky later in life, and she also attended some lectures by Anton Webern. Now, in spite of having all this contact with people that were revolutionizing music and, and were truly modernists, she had very serious opinions on modern music, as she had very serious and profound opinions on just about everything. And I have a quote. This is, this is in her own words now, you know, so we get a little bit of the uh, self-portraiture here. And this has to do with modern music, and this is in the composer's words. She says, Not to be modern or up-to-date should be the aim of the composer, but to be timeless. Very often I hear the reproach that I am not modern. The word modern alone is horrible for me. Sometimes one expresses it with the word atonal. Concerning the dissonances, I am not atonal enough. I don't see being modern as atonality, but in the whole form of the work. Constant atonality for me is artificial invention, and I do never wish to invent music, but to write it the way I feel or the way I have to. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of composers, maybe some present here, that would disagree with that, and I'm sure uh, she would still hold the same strong opinion. Uh, now, from Dr. Eckhart's unpublished biography, he describes how the composer would work. I mean, she would, I've read this whole version, and uh, there's um, several aspects to her working personality, and this is just one of them. And this is in Dr. Eckhart's words. She would sit at the piano day in and day out for weeks, working out her musical ideas, orchestrating, or stubbornly proofreading, or correcting scores through the many hours of the night. She was a perfectionist, as she knew the performance would not work out if the scores had not been carefully checked. And then he goes on, I can't remember one rehearsal which was without excitement and trouble. Well, she had a very lively personality. As anyone that's read the biography or knew her would, would, uh, would uh, understand. And we'll see that in the music tonight because it's very, very lively music. It goes from extreme streams in its contrasts of character. Um, but as Dr. Eckhart points out, she could be very, uh, quite a tough cookie in rehearsals sometimes and could be quite hard on performers until she get, got things the way she wanted them. And now I'm reading from the published biography, also by Dr. Eckhart. And this alludes to uh, the rehearsals that preceded uh, the first performance, or the, the attempt at the first performance, I should say. And this is in Dr. Eckhart's words again. At the time of this concert, everything seemed to develop to Sonia's satisfaction. I was in New York at the time, and since mail still went quite slowly from Austria in these years, I went to the Austrian consulate every day to see if I could read something about the performance in the newspapers. And there it was, Hubert Hafner's last concert. I read it again and again, and at first I, I did not understand, and I could not believe it. Hafner, the conductor, had dropped dead on the podium during the concert. Well, um, uh, he goes on in his biography, but I think I'm going to read from Paul Wickert's words. This is, this, this is from some of Paul's notes that he made for this concert, and this is in Paul's words. Dr. Eckhart's first thoughts were that Sonia had had a disagreement with the conductor and that this had led to the fatal stroke. <laughs> and a little parenthetical mark by Paul. Sonia was strong-willed and uncompromising when it came to her music. After a telegram and a letter to Vienna, it was revealed that the conductor had died of a heart attack while playing the piece before hers. He had lifted his arms to conduct, stretched, and suddenly fell over backwards. And there had been great confusion in the hall, and needless to say, her concerto was not played that night. I think this might have something to do with contemporary conducting technique. You never see modern conductors taking these big upbeats anymore. 
Okay, well, that brings us right into the concerto. Well, the concerto was not played that evening. It was, in fact, premiered a couple of years later in 1954. Uh, and that, that performance was recorded for broadcast. We do not have that tape anymore uh, because it was erased according to broadcast policy at the time. So this evening's performance is very, very fresh. This is falling on our ears for the first time, and it, it, it is indeed an historic occasion. I'd like to... Uh, show you a little bit about this music by actually having the orchestra playing some of it. And I think uh, this is yet our, th our third aspect of portraiture, getting uh, a feeling for the composer by the character of the music itself. The concerto begins in a very heroic fashion. The orchestra bursts out with color for about five measures, and then the composer strikes into the first theme. You'll hear it on the violin. And the whole time through this opening heroic or ecstatic character, uh, is upheld with, with a, a very, very strong and colorful motion. Okay, uh, obviously a bright, up-tempo feel, and that's something that I think, again, reading out her biography, you can recognize in her own character. Now, later on, as the movement progresses, this music goes on for a while, and then she settles into what she calls the main theme of the work, which is kind of interesting because she doesn't present her main theme first. In fact, the music of this theme is hardly ever heard again. It's not developed throughout this movement. It's the second theme that the one is the one that achieves the most development. It's developed throughout the first movement, and it also appears in a different form as the, the principal idea of the final movement as well. This character is quite different. It's got a little bit more humor to it. Uh, it's slower. It's a lot more lyrical. And the winds are featured uh, quite a bit. And she goes for the, the humorous or the colorful nature in the winds, as well as this lyrical character. Okay, and that's the stuff that the first movement of this work is made out of. Um, actually, this theme is not presented till almost the central point of the first movement, so that's something that's quite idiosyncratic, I think, to her style. She follows the school of Bach and um, of Beethoven with his shorter themes, and, and certainly Schoenberg's school, uh, this idea that Schoenberg kind of pulled in from Brahms of developing variations. So she builds her themes out of very small little melodic ideas. Sometimes they only last a measure or two. And then she'll spin them out until they fe she feels that the character has been presented. So that, in fact, development is going on all the time. So uh, even when a theme is being presented, it's already being developed. Um, but anyway, as this uh, work proceeds into the development proper, 
we hear uh, this main theme being developed. The first time it's developed, you hear it coming out in the violin, but it's accompanied by tr uh, two other instruments, the solo trumpet and the solo clarinet. So we get this little trio, which is, sounds quite kind of light music, and there's a lot of scurrying going around in the other parts, and they seem to be vying for uh, equal space, like who's going to be the most important voice, who's going to be the most important voice, but in fact they seem to be more or less equal. This eventually breaks out into a full orchestral development of the theme where you hear that theme coming out slowly in the basses and cellos, but there's still a flourish going on in the rest of the orchestra. second movement we get some of the most sublime music that you'll probably ever hear. As I was listening to the rehearsals of this movement, I was uh, just carried away so many times. It's, it's, uh, you notice some influence by composers like Alban Berg, for example. Um, the, the movement begins by uh, some very dark sounds, and as it progresses over the next four or five minutes, the rest of the orchestra sort of sneaks in. First the bass end of the orchestra starts with the melody and the bass clarinet. And then as the orchestra creeps in, it creeps in and eventually fills out, and it's quite an ecstatic experience, uplifting. It's all quite slow and, and a kind of adagio flavor. Uh, but not only are you being uplifted emotionally, but you're actually being uplifted in sound as well, because the orchestra just creeps in quite systematically. It starts in the low end and eventually fills out through the altos and tenors and, until we get the full treble range. And it's not until then that you actually hear the solo violin come in. So what I've chosen as an excerpt to show you is just the opening of this section, the first about a minute of music, so you actually won't hear the violin come in. It takes a while for it to develop. As I mentioned before, the last movement is built up from the main theme of the first movement. Uh, the classical model for the last movement of a concerto is the rondo form. A rondo consists 
very basically of a refrain that keeps coming back, and it's usually a light-hearted sort of refrain. And in fact, we do get a light-hearted character in this movement. It's not a strict Rondoan form, but it is a Rondoan character. Uh, because there's often contrasting ideas that are brought in just like they would in a rondo form. It just doesn't have that same uh, classical format of the rondo form. To give you an idea of how the theme is presented in the last movement, we'll just hear the first few measures of, of the third movement. Finally, um, just to give you a feeling for some of the music that sneaks its way in in this movement, uh, well, roughly halfway through the movement, there's this march that comes in. You hear the timpani kind of pounding away, and it's like there's, there's, you're ready to start marching already. And then all of a sudden, the rhythm goes kind of strange, because when the strings come in, they don't come in on regular beats. And when the tune comes in, it doesn't really sound like your, ab your average march, like the sort of thing you'd expect soldiers to be parading down the middle of Main Street doing. And in fact, she has this section marked grotesque, uh, one of my teachers, when he was giving a lecture on expressionistic music, mainly the music of Schoenberg, he, he was relating the music of the expressionistic painters, and you might think of this as an analogy when you're looking at the artwork in, in the hall. But he said, uh, if you think of the way these painters abstracted reality as, as distorting it in some way, kind of like looking at the world through some kind of liquid or a glass of water or something, you know, you, there's always some, some proportions that are wrong. Uh, that's the feeling I get with this march, because you, you definitely get the feeling you can stamp your foot to it. I mean, it does, it, it's, it's, it's uh, marchable, but at the same time, it's got this kind of grotesque distortion, which is kind of humorous in a way. This music doesn't last very long, and then it's followed by something that the, con the composer describes alludes to German bagpipes. So that kind of sneaks its way in. It's got the violin with some repeated notes, and then the march sneaks in again. You recognize it right away, and then it's out. You never see it again. Okay, I think we're ready now to begin to let the orchestra take over as we move into the open rehearsal of the Violin Concerto. <laughs> 